Welcome to the Capstone Project session. I'll now turn it over to our presenter. Hi, good morning, everyone. Okay, my name is Teresa John Baptist Bruno. I am a registered nurse and I have been a nursing leader for about, uh, oh, just over 15 years. On a personal note, I am a, I'm a wife and a mother of two young adults and I live in Canada. I have included um, two pictures on my first slide. Can you have the next slide, please? Um, hopefully to give you a little bit more um, about, tell, me, tell you a little bit more about me. Uh, the first picture is a um, picture of the Horseshoe Falls, um, and that's the largest of the Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is one of our major and, and um, popular uh, attractions in, in Canada, in the Toronto, Toronto area. So I live about an hour away from Niagara Falls, and um, it actually is on the border of New York State and the province of Ontario. And so we tend to visit there quite a bit. It is one of those places that um, we go to recharge. It, it is an amazing scenery. And so um, we do that in the summer just to kind of, it's, it's you, you tend to, it's like traveling away, but not living the country. And so it's, it's an amazing place to, to visit. And just a little bit of trivia for you, the, the amount of water that goes over the falls is estimated to be, um, at approximately can fill about a million bathtubs in about a minute. And that tells you how magnificent that is. So we, we enjoy doing that. The second picture also gave you an idea. So as much as we're proud to be Canadian, we're also very proud of our Caribbean heritage and we tend to visit, we like to travel. So we tend to visit the Caribbean as often as we can. And so um, we do that again to, to decompress and to, and to recharge. And that picture is just um, to give you an indication of what the background, the backyard actually of the family home is in the Caribbean. So I just wanted to give you, share that um, bit of personal, um, of my personality with you. In terms of um, why am I here today? I'm here today to share with you um, my capstone project. It's uh, the alternate leadership model, um, frontline leadership model. And just to give you a little bit of background as to how I got to that um, in terms of looking at um, improvement and making sure things are, are better. I'll give you a little bit of my professional history that led me to look at this kind of projects. Uh, when I started my nursing career, I was, I studied at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And as a new graduate, we were always, um, it was always impressed upon us that we needed to be um, patient advocates. It was, uh, the organization also um, was very focused on building a reputation of best practice, excellence in patient care, and positive patient outcomes. So being a nurse at the bedside, that was very important. The importance of ensuring that you um, provide the quality of care that patients and their family need, especially in a time of vulnerability. That hasn't really changed as, as, I, I, as a leader. It just changes how I, I, I deliver that and how I meet that objective. And so at the bedside, I had the autonomy to basically make the decisions that impacts patients positively. Um, as a manager, I do have people who work with me. So now because I don't, um, I don't provide the care directly, the teams who work with me provide that care. And so my responsibility is to ensure that they have what they need to provide that care and to provide the best care for patients. And so what I, in, in terms of doing that, and how I get that accomplished is to ensure in that they have the right um, a healthy work environment, they have a work-life balance, they have their schedules are, are, are okay for them to work with, they have the vacation that they need, um, they have the op opportunity to, um, the autonomy to make decisions and to be creative um, in an everyday, in everyday situation. Next slide, please. About a year and a half ago, I got hired as um, a, peri service, a perioperative services manager at the current organization that I work with. And 
as a perioperative manager, I'm responsible for areas like the pre-admission or the pre-anesthesia clinic, the operating rooms, the day surgery unit, um, and the post-anesthetic care unit or the PACU as it's commonly referred to. Um, when I took over that role, the interim manager at the time um, told me about uh, that we did have about seven vacancies. That was kind of noteworthy because that's the first time I've ever gone into an area with such a high vacancy um, in the operating room, understanding that the operating room had about 20 something nurses. Um, but anyway, in getting to know the staff and getting to speak with them, they started talking about, well, you know, we tend to orient people, we tend to, people are hired, we orient them, then they leave. So there's a picture of, um, that started to emerge of um, high turnover, uh, low retention. Another thing I tend to do when I go into an organization or take on a new unit is I tend to give, um, I, I tend to give a survey. It's a simple survey with about four questions, but what it does, it allows me <clears throat> to get information on the, the teams, their work environment, the challenges and the workplace culture. And the, the, the questions are simple. The, it's about how long have you worked here? What do you like about working here? What don't you like about working here? And if there was one thing you had the opportunity to change, what would that be? Now in this situation, because we had people talking quite a bit about um, turnover, people are not staying and people are leaving, I added a fifth question. And the fifth question was, do you have a perspective on why people are leaving? Now, what, what came out was fairly interesting. And the results of that, um, most of the staff indicated to a lack of frontline leadership, um, a lack of frontline leadership support. They talk about favoritism and especially as it relates to scheduling, vacation, um, vacation approvals. But they also talk about a lot about gossiping. They talk about exclusion of some team members and not others. Um, the new or the novice nurses talk about how they did not feel supported or they did not feel um, uh, prepared to do the work that they were trained to do and there was no support for them. There was also um, comments about lack of uh, growth and development. And what is interesting, this in this organization, when I came in, there is a resource nurses, there's a manager role, and then there's the resource nurses. The resource nurses are given, um, were given the autonomy basically to um, approve vacations, to change people's schedules, to more or less manage the, the, the areas without, they have a lot of accountability, a, a lot of responsibility, sorry. Um, without the accountability. And so they went around and do a lot of that, but that impacted the staff negative, negatively. And so one of the things, and again, from an organizational perspective, what we saw was we saw that um, there is no, there's a decrease in staff and hence the seven vacancies. Now, most hospitals have a surgical backlog caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it, it is not just a Canadian issue, it's a worldwide issue because most hospitals had to put elective surgeries on hold while they deal with the pressures of COVID-19. So what we find with the inability to keep staff, we know we have a nursing shortage. We do have, in, we cannot now um, do the care that we need. So from an organizational perspective, most of the hospitals around us are now looking at increasing the um, surgical capacity to about uh, 90 to 100 percent. We as an organization are still hovering at about 63, 65 percent. And so that is significant impact on the delivering patient care. Plus, we also have had now we're looking at an environment that is really not conducive to staff staying in that area. What's interesting is that the, the resource nurses were never trained. So the one for the recovery, for the um, operating room, sorry, had been in place for about 15 years. There was really no additional training. There was um, for leadership, no leadership training. And at the same time, 
the criteria it seemed that for having her in that position was her length of service. And so, you know, there's been a lot of research and a lot of data that talked about some of the factors that contribute to nurses either quitting their jobs or, um, or leaving the profession altogether. And that has to do with um, lack of, um, lack of job satisfaction, incompetent leadership, um, the ability, not having the, the ability to grow and to make decisions. So some of those things impact and that impacts the level of care and the quality of care that any organization is able to deliver. Next slide, please. So as I've said before, um, my responsibility is to ensure that we provide excellence in, in nursing care and positive patient outcomes. Um, now, also, there's also significant impact um, findings about the impact of leadership on both the financial as well as the human capital of any organization. And that um, in nursing or in, in healthcare, that is crucial because it does impact the patient delivery of patient care. So in terms of the financial cost and, and human capital, it has been estimated that it can cost anywhere from forty to $60,000 to orient just one nurse. It is also been, been said that um, managers uh, or leaders are essential in building a strong workforce. Now, with, for nurses to be, to provide the, the um, best patient outcomes that we expect, we need to be able to provide them with the tools, the resources, um, and all of that that can positively impact um, not just patient care, but the financial health of the organization. Um, leaders are supposed to be the role models and to be able to lead the way and, and model the way that they want the teams to behave and to be able to meet the goals of the organization. Kuzis and Posner um, really talked about exemplary leadership. And they talk about the principles of exemplary leadership. And that involves um, leaders being the role models for their teams. They also talk about leaders challenging the, the, challenging the process. And so in terms of looking at the process that I came into, it's an opportunity to look at it and see how can we do things differently. Uh, they also talk about inspiring a vision and ensuring that we have transparency, inclusivity to ensure that the vision is shared among the teams and that everybody has the interest in doing that. But also we talk about ensuring that we empower people to act and to, to, and to do the things that they need to do to help to, to create a better environment, to, to be create a better, better outcomes. And so in looking at all of that, my recommendation is to eliminate the resource nurse role and to include an assistant manager role. And in, and with, in the inclusion of an assistant manager role, also talking from the, the, taking into consideration the staff talk about not having support, also to recommend that to include a perioperative team leader role and the, the benefits of those roles, one, let's start with the assistant manager, is we eliminate the issue of favoritism. We bring in that objectivity. We bring in that equity. We ensure that the staff uh, equally be considered for their vacations to look at their schedules and ensure that people are not just changing their schedules because of who they are for whatever reason. It, it, if there's an opportunity to change the schedule or need to change the schedule, there is a dialogue and it has to do with more or less operations rather than who you are. Um, in terms of the team, the, the team leader role, it provides an opportunity for frontline support. It provides that, so the, not just for the novice nurses, the novice nurses will have somebody, as much as we have an educator, but we'll have somebody on real time at the front line to provide that mentorship and that coaching and that assistance they would need. Both roles with the manager and the educator will allow for um, inclusive, in, inclusivity, sorry, creativity, allow for autonomy to make decisions for nurses to have a conversation. Uh, Liz Wiseman, who is uh, the author of the, the book Multipliers, um, talk about multipliers are, are leaders who 
work to build um, their teams and to build leaders in their teams and by promoting creativity, encouraging staff to have discussion and to have debate and to ensure that you have um, a stronger team to be able to move forward to accomplish the goals that you need to accomplish. In talking of the, about the work environment that we have, we talk about the type of culture. And Edgar Schein talks a lot about um, the culture and the impact of how any organization will meet its goals based on the culture. In this situation, when we eliminate the resourceness role, which is not necessarily the only problem spot, but is a major problem or the major contributor to some of the, so the problems that we have and the challenges that we're having. And shifting that helps us to shift um, and to get rid of the negative cultural influencers, hopefully to shift our, um, our environment and make it a bit different than what it's supposed to be. Next slide, please. So one of the things that have been in all the research, it talks about, in, especially in hospitals, that um, for excellent processes or to, for, to have robust processes, it is important to have engaged frontline staff to ensure that they have input. And once you, you, you have to ensure, because leaders are instrumental in ensuring that they develop their team, it is important that we look at the leadership style, the leadership model, to be able to have staff engaged, to be able to, and to, to meet the, the, the goals and objectives of the organization. The reality is about that the top performing hospitals do have that um, opportunity. And so every hospital, because it's important to provide the quality of care to patients, especially at the time of vulnerability, need to work to that, to, to that objective. And, and that is where we're trying to make sure from our program and for our organization is to meet that goal. Next slide, please. So um, that's just indicating the references that I have had to research through this capstone project. That's just a small sample of um, the references um, for this project. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of um, concluding this, Peter Drucker is one of, um, I actually, is one of my favorite authors and um, one of the favorite organizational gurus. And he's, he said that there are only three things that happen naturally in an organization. One is friction, the other two is confusion, um, and the third one is underperformance. Everything else requires leadership. And that is why looking at the leadership structure of our organization was very important to be able to move the bar and to move forward. Thank you very much. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing with us. We have time for a few questions. Feel free to post your questions and your comments for our speaker in the chat. We are already getting comments about what an excellent presentation you've done. Thank you. Everyone continue to include those questions. Yes, so can I have a question there? Oh, hey. Sure. Yes, uh, hello, Teresa. Uh, I think you did, did a very a great great job on that presentation. Thank you very uh, much. I'm also from the Caribbean. I'm Haitian, so uh, we have Ooh. something in common here. So, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, um, um, here your your presentations. Uh, you talk, I believe you are a manager in the healthcare system, correct? Yeah. 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 Have you seen a difference? Uh, do, you, do you in your mind, at least based on your experience, do you see a difference among a manager and a, and a leader? Uh, and if so, how does that uh, influence your influence the work the work the work based, based on your experience? So one of the things I, I do, I think as a manager, we have the title manager um, is what we go by in any organization and especially in healthcare. But I personally believe that we need to lead about 90% of the times. We manage the budget, we manage the schedules, we manage the operational needs. Um, behind the scenes. But when it comes to the people, we need to be able to lead them. In healthcare, it is crucial because we are taking care of patients, um, we're taking care of people at the most vulnerable. One of the things I always remind the nurses is that 
working in a hospital or a clinic, that's our, our environment. That's our, our space. We are very comfortable in that space. Patients are not. And especially when you talk about going for surgery, um, patients always talk about, um, or they're not sure if they're going to wake up from anesthesia. Um, they're very anxious from the time they hear the word surgery. So as a manager, my role is to ensure that I lead the teams, ensure that we provide a good environment for the staff to work, um, that their schedules and scheduling um, is a great, it, it's a huge aspect of, of staff's lives because you, everybody works and your work, it's not, people sometimes say work life and home life, but it's really not two separate things. It's, a, it's one entity because work, whatever happens at work usually seeps over to home. And so it's important to ensure that we have a work life, a work environment that is conducive for staff to feel comfortable, to have the autonomy, to make decisions, to discuss, especially after hours, because patients are counting on us to deliver the best care, to make sure that they go home safely and to make sure that we know we are on top of our game. And so that's why it's important. I enjoy your answer because I'm, I'm very also, also very passionate with leadership. That's something, that's one of the things I do. Even for my, doc, my doctorate, I, I did it. My, I do have, I do have a, a PhD in management. My concentration was in leadership in organizational change. So when I heard your presentation, I was fascinated by, by your concept. So I just wanted to make sure uh, we, we have we have much more uncommon than I thought. So, and I think we do. <laughs> I think we do. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for the question. I appreciate it. I know. Wonderful. Wonderful. Our next question is, as you remove the resource nurse and add another assistant manager, how does that help the floor nurses, especially with shortages, increased workload and the demands of patient care? In this situation, um, our resource nurse really was not assisting um, on the front lines. She should have been, but wasn't. Um, one of the things, as I said, scheduling is very important to staff. So we need to ensure that their schedules, their vacations, when they need the time to decompress, that they have it. It's not based on, are you my friend or are you not my friend? And so the resource, the, 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 the I'm sorry, the assistant manager is going to be responsible to ensuring that the day-to-day -day activity and business activity of the organization, of the program, as a matter of fact, will remain objective, equal, and we, there will be some consistency with that. The team leader role is what is going to also enhance the frontline support. Because when you are trying to keep newer staff in an environment, they need to have the support. The educator is not always available. But having somebody who is not really assigned to any patient or not to, assigned to the to the old operating, any specific operating room, allows that float, that individual to float around, to provide the assistance, to provide the support, to provide the mentorship. Um, and sometimes when you're short staff, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to say, okay, so have all hands on deck. It's a, it's a matter of determining where you need the hands, where is the best place to have it, to have the best impact. And so, um, because their scheduling and all of that was an issue, we need to make sure that we eliminate all of those challenges to build a more secure environment for the teams and to also provide them with that support that they need on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in terms of the cost, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm just anticipating there is that in the background, in terms of the cost, what is interesting is because of the seniority of the level of seniority of the resource nurse. She's the, the salary for the resource nurse as well as the assistant manager is comparable. And so we're not necessarily taking any information, any uh, monies out from the front line, but actually giving them the support that they need with the dollars that we have to make sure that they have a better work environment. Wonderful. And their continued question is kind of a twofold question. Yeah. Would creating a new manager position take away from the hands-on piece? And would the nurse be better utilized as a nurse working the floor? 
Well, so again, as I've said before, part of the problem, or it's not, you do need hands-on. And that will continue to do because we are short staff anyway. So my, my focus has been to recruit and it's continuously recruiting. As a, a program, our director, we have a directive to continue recruiting to ensure that we can meet the demands of, um, for example, what we need to meet and get in, uh, to address the backlog. So as far as getting the hands on at the front line, that is also another aspect that is being worked on simultaneously with this. But one of the challenges is that if you do not have a healthy work environment, if you have, do not have the environment and the support, whether it's from the leadership or whether it's right at the bedside for the staff, you are going to continue to have that turnover. And to be able to, to stop that turnover, and all the literature has said is that um, the leadership style and the manager, the, the way we will lead the people at the front impacts the ability to whether they stay or whether they go. So we need to look at what the nurses are saying to us. They do not have the frontline support, frontline leadership support that they need. But we need to eliminate the, the, the um, favoritism, um, the fact that people are, um, are making decisions that impact the staff but don't have the accountability for that. And so with that one position, we do that, but we also are adding that team leader role to ensure we have the frontline support. But on the outside of that, we are continuing to hire because we need to build. So like I said, we have seven vacancies. That is a process that is being worked simultaneously with that to ensure we have sufficient frontline support. Wonderful. Another question we have is, tell us about something you learned throughout this process that surprised you. You know, um, it's interesting that um, as, as, a, as a leader, you go through and you see different things. Um, it's, it's the lack of understanding of the impact that the resource nurse is having on the patient care. And I think, so in talking to the staff, a lot of them talked about, well, you know, people are leaving because they, they're moving closer to home. Um, I, they never really take into consideration what's happening in the work environment. They, they live in it every day. They, um, they see it every day, but to them, that's the norm. To me coming in thinking, okay, something is wrong and I need to understand what that is. So my, I think would say my level of surprise is they did not link what's happening to them and within their work environment with the fact that staff are just coming in and they are saying, no, I'm not dealing with that, I'm leaving. Um, unlike we had a consultant say to us, people are voting with their feet, they are leaving and they're not staying, but the staff um, were not aware of the connection between the two. Great point. What is one bit of advice you would give to Walden students who are approaching this stage of their program? The Capstone Project it is, um, I will say it's, in, it's intense. Uh, <laughs> it is intense. It is, um, I would say, I have to put a plug for Dr. Taylor. She is amazing. Um, and she made sure that um, we, we came through this very well, provide as much support. And um, so it's a matter of putting the time. So some, uh, if you go through the entire program, everybody said, well, you know, if you put two hours a day that you will, you will get through the program. For your capstone project, I felt I, felt I put in time every day. I, I, I made sure that I, um, I put in more than two hours a day, but I put it every day. It was a concentrated effort understanding that this was, I needed to ensure that I did it and I did it well and I finished strong. But um, so you, you need to you need to um, pace yourself, but make sure you um, you put in the time because that will see you through. And again, Dr. Taylor is amazing. Outstanding. You are receiving some comments about how wonderful your presentation is. Thank you, and it looks like Dr. Taylor has said you've done a great job also. Thank you very much. Do you have any final remarks for us? What I would say as leaders, anybody that's going into leadership or any have the opportunity to be leaders is understanding that um, 
a lot of times, as much as it's about your teams, it's a lot of times it's about you. Ensure that you self-reflect. Some, we are not perfect. None of us are. And sometimes you may be trying to do something that is meaningful, but it may not come out that way. Always try to be humble and self-reflect and make the adjustment where necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, we appreciate you sharing your experiences with us today.